in this new book, uh, a fellow by the name of Jeff Newman, you know, I, I get an email uh, a couple of years ago and to, you know, he's, he kind of writes me that this is what he's done. And he's basically telling me that he's, he turned a few thousand dollars into 50 million or whatever. And, you know, you know, there's always a bit of skepticism there, right? But I, I, well, I read it back. First of all, I'm not doing a book now, but hey, if you can prove that, that's a great story and I'd be interested. Turns out for reasons I didn't anticipate, within a year, I decided to do on non-market wizards. I get back to him and he's, I have him send, he sends me all the statements going back to 2006. And a guy literally turned less than 5,000 into 50 million. This is the How to Trade Stocks Options Podcast, brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com, where we cover finance, stocks, options, entrepreneurship, education, and money. And here's your host, voted one of the top 100 people in finance, Christopher Ewell. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks Options podcast. Today, we have a special lesson for you. I'm putting it here on the podcast because I really believe that this is going to provide you massive, massive value. And that's what I'm trying to do here. And hey, listen, if this podcast was useful to you at all, I really highly suggest that you go check out the full trading course at AIStockTradingSystem.com. That's AIStockTradingSystem.com. Markets are people. People are predictable. Outlier can show you how to track market fear and greed with artificial intelligence on over 1,300 of the largest market cap names. Visit outlier.com to learn more. That's O-V-T-L-Y-R.com. They have a free pilot program for the rest of 2021 that you can get access to right now at O-V-T-L-Y-R.com. That's O-V-T-L-Y-R.com. Hey, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time we give you more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter every single week. I'm actually uh, reading Stock Market Wizards right now for the first time. I- I've read all of your other books and somehow yeah. missed Stock Market Wizards. Like I was like, I know, because I've talked to Minervini a few times and I was like, I know he's in here somewhere and I'm skimming through all the books and I'm like, where is he? And I was like, I missed one. How did I miss this one? Okay, so yeah, I'm just just getting to that one. Uh, but yeah, huge, huge fan. Um, so, so Jack, you know, I, I also had a chance to talk with Larry Height last week and Larry's quite a character and you know, that, that, that made me start to think, um, you probably have some pretty good stories about, uh, some of these, these men and women that you put in your books. What are some of your favorites? Uh, by stories, uh, well, you know, I included basically the stuff that I thought was interesting or useful, I put in the books. So, you know, um, uh, and you know, there, there were, you know, there weren't any side stories because if they were, if they were, they were interesting, I would have, I would have put them in a book. You know, basically, I'm always looking for one or two things in these chapters. One, what's useful information like for trading, and two, what's in, you know, what's a good story. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the, the first without the second makes for a very dull book. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, when things that occurred, um, you know, I kind of put in the chapters, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't think of anything where somebody said, and even when they said you couldn't use it, I put that in the chapter. <laughs> so like, I think, you know, we, you know, basically, so I think like Gary Bielfeld, who um, at the time I interviewed him, what kind of an interesting story, you know, this is way back, uh, back in the 80s. And uh, I was a research director and, you know, we would have to put out some reason what's going on in the markets. And, you know, in the bond market, there, were, there, was, there was always like Solomon and Brothers and Morgan Stanley doing this. And, and then there was this BLH and I'm like, who the hell is BLH? Turns out it's one guy in Peoria. Well, so when I was doing a book, that was, that was you know, how's one guy in Peoria end up you know, being a, a mover in the bond market? Mm-hmm. Turns out the guy started out with uh, like trading one or two coin contracts and, and built it up and built it up and built it up. Um, but he was like, the best analogy, and I probably put it in the book, he was like Gary Cooper, you know? Yep, nope, like worst, worst interview I ever had. He just couldn't drag anything out of it. And finally, I, I one point, and most of that chapters, it's kind of unusual. Most of the chapters are more, more interview than 
than narrative text. But that's the one chapter where there's more narrative than interview, I think, because it was really hard to pull anything out of him. And uh, at one point I asked him, you know, he said something about the similarity between poker and trading. And I said, can you, can you, go? Oh, that's interesting. Can you elaborate on that? And he says, can you turn it off? And so I turn it off and then he gives me like a good analogy. And it's, it's totally innocuous, you know? And I said, what? And finally he said, okay, you could use it. But he was like so guarded. And, uh, but that was a case where he said, turn it off and then, but I, you know, then he said, okay, you can use it. You know, so, so like I say, anything that there was, uh, anything that was a good story, I kind of put in the book. Well, you're kind oh. of the forefront of like trading podcasts, right? Because back in the day, there wasn't anything like this, but it was really a conversation you were having between two people like this that, that you wrote down and shared with others. There was a big distinction really though. Um, the, the interviews I did, well, Beautiful was like an exception. It was like an hour or two, two, whatever. But most of the interviews tend to be much longer. And so when you're reading the book, if I were to do a verbatim, like this podcast, right? So it's, it's fine if you listen to it. If you translate it to paper, it's not going to read that well mm-hmm. because our conversation is not the same as writing. And people don't realize how illiterate we all sound if you transcribe our conversation to paper, because we go off on tangents, we don't finish sentences, we, you know, it's a mess. Um, so if you were to transcribe the actual interviews, well, first of all, a lot of those interviews would be book length. And second of all, they would put you to sleep. So they're different than a podcast in that they're highly distilled and edited. Mm-hmm. So if I do eight or 10 hours, you know, I'm kind of pulling out the, the best hour of it or best hour and a half or two, depending how long the chapter is. And it's not necessarily, it won't be in the, in the same order as the conversation because in an actual long conversation, you might come back to the same topic multiple times and it's a mess to have it appear all over the place. So you consolidate it and then the sequence may not make sense and then people don't finish sentences and so on. So you basically, what, you, what I'm, my goal is always to try to, if I can use verbatim, great. But that's that's a freebie. That's that's like a luxury. Most times you have to th- fix things because, like I say, people don't finish sentences, they're ungrammatical or whatever. But you, you're basically staying true to as close as you can to what they said or intended to say. And I send the interviews, I, when I finish to the interview subjects always, you know, as part of my understanding, I do it for two reasons. One, I want them to be open. I don't want them to be guarded. And two, I want to make sure that I've got it right. And ne- almost never do I have anybody say, well, that's not what I said. You know, they, they think that's what they said because it's what they said cleaned up. Right. What they said in the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's there. If I can use the exact words, that's great. And I do it. But if it's non-grammatical, I fix it, you know? Mm -hmm. So you've written not just The Market Wizards. You've written like a whole slew of books, right? Yeah, yeah. What what would you feel is your favorite topic? Well, I've... Favorite topic, well, it's always... All my books are market-oriented. I did a book, what's called Market Sense and Nonsense, which is something that I did for my own. (laughs) It didn't sell anywhere near like The Market Wizards books, which I didn't expect to. But I just wanted to do it. So I had like a lot of pet peeves about things that people just just get wrong, you know, about markets and misunderstand and, and all of these things. So um, I did this book, Market Sense and Nonsense. And uh, so I guess in a sense, that was, that was the kind of book I did for myself. And as far as what the most difficult books were, were the analytical books I did. And they, they took a lot more work and you know, you sell a lot less copies. You just do that to sort of say, well, you know, I, I can do, I can cover this topic better than it's been covered. And you're just doing it for some sort of self-satisfaction of, of producing, at least in what my mind is the best book on the topic. But it, mm-hmm. you don't do it for money. And not that I do Walker Wizards books for money, 
But those books, I know when I write them, I'm going to make, I'm going to make money. So if I was purely dollar driven, I would never do any book other than a market wizard book. It doesn't, it doesn't make any financial sense. You know, speaking of financial sense, having the opportunity to speak to the people that I have had on the podcast completely, like literally 180 degreed how I traded and, and, and I've never seen anything like it before inside my own portfolio. Was it a similar situation for you getting to absorb everything from these, these men and women, and then going into your portfolio and saying, Oh, that's not how uh, Ed Sakota would do it. Oh, that's not yeah. how someone else would do it. So, you know, one of the main lessons that and since you've read my books, you know, this one of the main lessons I try to draw through to everybody is don't try to copy somebody else's mm-hmm, stuff. Mm-hmm. Unless it resonates with you and it seems like, hey, that's a perfect fit, then you, you can try to emulate it. But essentially, it is one of the key ingredients is always developing your own style. So uh, it's not going to be as good as the market wizards, but you can't duplicate what they do because they have certain innate things about their style that fits them and their skills that fit them that then that make sense on paper, but you can't do it. So like in this... This the latest book I did, The Unknown Market Wizards, mm-hmm. right? You have some traders like who will really focus on events and like a central bank announcement. And there's a couple of traders who do this. And I'll just take one, uh, Ahmed Sal, he just does tremendous preparation for this. He, like he's, he has researched decades of it. He's kept you know, notes on every you know, central bank announcement ever. He plans out every trade. He does massive amount. And then he knows exactly what he's going to do almost to the word of what's said. And he's there. He's got the orders ready. He's, his fingers on, on the mouse. He's 100% folk. He's kind of done like, oh, sort of like mind, like calming himself down, focusing. His world is that screen. And when he's, when he's in that type of situation, he'll take a huge order relative to his size. Now, he also has amazing discipline. And if it doesn't go the way he he thinks it is, he'll be out in less than a minute. Now, he has trades. He's had days where he's made 50% plus, like maybe 20 or 30 of those days. I mean, people would like a year like that. And people could read that and say, hey, that sounds good. But you know what? 9,999 people out of 10,000 that would try it, it would blow up. Mm-hmm. So it just because somebody's style may sound appealing doesn't mean you can do it. Ultimately, you have to find something that that fits for you. So in my case, what, what I learned, it, it wasn't a matter of copying anybody's style. It was more a matter of picking up, you know, useful things that were useful for any style. So the best example I can think of, and this is it, advice that came through from a number of trade number of traders, but the first one was Bruce Kovner, and he said it most succinctly. And one of the things he said um, about his own trading, and at the time, he was already beginning to trade size. He said, um, I always know I'm going to get out before I get in. And, you know, to me, that's probably, if I had to say my favorite line in the whole market wizard series, it's that line, because it's one sentence, and it is extraordinarily powerful if you take it you know, if you take it to heart. So that's something that, yes, uh, I, I, I've adapted. So when I trade, even though the way I trade has nothing to do with the way Covenant trades, but one of the things I do is every time I put in an order, it's, it, it's accompanied with a stop. You know, I know what I'm receiving on that trade. It gives me great uh, mental comfort because, you know, I established that. I avoid all the agony of what do I get in? Do I stay out? What do I do? It's going to be against me. I get rid of all that garbage and, and I define the risk. So, so um, uh, I, I was really fortunate to be able to, to chat with Larry Height uh, a couple of weeks ago. And when I did um, our, our meeting, he, uh, he kind of ghosted me. And then uh, I emailed him and I'm like, hey, I, you know, I don't know what happened. Hopefully everything's okay. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, he's really old. I hope he didn't die, <laughs> but it turned out okay. <laughs> but you know, he was he was a real character, right? Very animated, had a lot to say in, in all the different topics and everything. So 
what was your experience like? I mean, you you went to their homes, you went to their their businesses. You, you saw, uh, if I remember correctly, you saw like from palaces to one of the stock market wizards, and I forget which one. He was an immigrant from another country, and he was so proud Turkey. of the fact that he got a free office. Yeah, and, Turkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it it did range quite quite a bit. Um, I forget where. In fact, in Larry Hyde's case, I don't remember. That's so long ago. I don't even remember where I interviewed him. Although I, I will tell you, the way I found the way I got Larry Hyde, I I attended. He was giving a talk, and um, I attended it, and he was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> I said yeah, he would be a good interview subject. Plus, you know, Larry was like the first. That was the first CTA that like reached a uh, billion dollars. Yeah. Away. So it, it fit the theme of the book as well, uh, but he was he was a great interview because uh, uh, he had a lot of stories. He had a great sense of humor. And he had these odd things in his background. He was, I think, uh, he had uh, not that he managed the Beatles, but I, I remember he was a rock and top. Mm -hmm. I don't know who he managed, but he had some association there. I think what it was now, but uh, he had a lot of interesting things in his background, and he. He wasn't that young when I interviewed him, so I guess he's he's probably you know I'm surprised you know he's still still there. And he's still old. kicking, and he's still got a great attitude too. So I I really appreciated that. Yeah, and you know, um, as far as locations, they 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 varied uh, obviously. Uh, um, you know, in in Marcus's case, it was like he had a, he had Rocky Stallone's old house. Over oh wow! In Malibu, on Malibu Beach, yeah. So I remember we did the interview in the house, we were on the beach, all over the place. So. so one of my favorite stories in the book, and I, I forget who it is, and you probably could remember off the top of your head, but sure. it was uh, it was a gentleman who he recently took over. This was in the hedge fund market wizards. Uh, he took a, he started his fund. He's at home. He's making money. He makes thirty thousand dollars on a trade. He goes and tells his wife. And his wife says, that's nice, honey, but you still need to take out the trash. And I, I identified with that so hard because I don't know how many times I've shown my wife my phone and be like, hey, check this out. And she's like, oh, that, that's nice. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that is the funniest story I've heard. Yeah, uh, I, I remember that. I think it was. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I know who it is. I think it was me. Um, it's probably... Steve Clark, I think. Steve Clark. I, I tell you, yeah, that one that just, there's so think, many stories, but that one in particular just really yeah. hit me because I knew that one. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so Jack, yeah, I, that's why I say it's... Who would you say, because I, I know it'd be like, like saying, who's your favorite child, but who would you say you learned the most from personally? That's, you know, it, it is hard because, uh, yeah, their influences, I guess, you know, five books is a lot of traders, a lot of influence. Um, and it's hard to delineate that. Um, I can tell you, I can tell you what my favorite interviews were. And basically, they usually, usually are the first chapter. Uh, oh, okay. Because, um, not always. Uh, in, in Hedge Fund Market Wizards, I think, I would say my favorite interview there was, was Ed Thorpe. And he wasn't the first chapter because the there was the longest interview. It's the longest chapter in any of the market was books. So I thought it was too long to, to use as a, as a first chapter. But typically the interviews I like the most personally for any combination of reasons, um, I usually put first. So- uh, Gotcha. So Ed Thorpe, he's, can, he's can, the one can, who uh, who beat the dealer, right? Yeah. So he he wrote Beat the Dealer, which kind of changed the way Las Vegas works. Great story. That. I mean, you know, they had meetings, what to do with this math professor, what to should knock him off. You know, literally, you know, he did have in the chapter, I have a, a story about an attempt on his life, you know, yeah. like, which is like a, straight out of Hollywood because he's going down a road and this, his brakes don't work, you know, and it's down how it works. Gosh, yeah. You know, so, you know, really, it's like crazy stuff like that. So, uh, but he had quite a varied life. Uh, besides that whole element, 
Um, he, he, he was, he came up with all these strategies. He was like a true pioneer. And a lot of people that don't realize that I mean, he was, he was like the first market neutral fund, the first convertible arbitrage fund, the first statistical arbitrage fund. He kind of, he was the first, he came up with the Black-Scholes model or the mathematical equivalent of it years before the paper was published. So he was like just, you know, a total innovator. And, uh, and a lot of people, you know, people have heard of him because of Beat the Dealer and some people may know that he, he, was, he was a manager, but I don't think people appreciate the, the extent of the things that he, that he really was the first to do, uh, really extraordinary. Yeah, for sure. I, I remember reading through that. And then there's so many of the traders who talk about the, the correlation between gambling and trading. And I just talked to uh, a man in Australia and he has, it's, it's like a, uh, it's a horse racing, basically it's a horse racing hedge fund where everyone pools their money. And he's such a great horse race better that he goes out and bets for them. And he's like the hedge fund manager at this, uh, with his investors. Although you have a tremendous bit of asked right there. Um, <laughs> the analogy is when, when gambling does come in, I would make a distinction here. So all the traders would, would take uh, exception to, to an analogy between trading and gambling in a literal sense. When they're talking about gambling, it has to be the type of gambling where it is possible to get an edge. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so poker would be an example, right? So uh, poker, everybody has a negative edge because money comes out of the pot. But if you're skilled, that skill can override that negative edge. And even though there's a lot of luck in poker, over time, skill will out almost all the time. So, so when it's gambling, it has to be something where there's potential for skill. Or like your horse racing example, if a guy's really good at picking Horses, you know, handicapping it, so there could be an edge, but never would never be something like like roulette or you know some pure game, except in Ed Thorpe's case, where it was roulette as one of the things he did, and he did that <laughs> he did that via using Newtonian physics to predict where the ball was going to land, which is quite a different thing than uh, you know uh, you know than when people try to come up with systems which are impossible, of course, because it's random. So um, so it's always got to be, if it's gambling, it's got to be someplace where it's a possible edge. Or like Blackjack in Thorpe's case, where at least in, his, in the early days, even though Blackjack has a has a negative, has an edge in favor of the house, which it has to, but the edge is smaller than any other game. And Thorpe's big insight was that if you change the size of the bet based on the probability of, of, of the moment, uh, in other words, uh, if there are a lot of tens out, you, you bet very little. And if there are a few tens out, you bet a lot, that you could change the odds to having the, having the edge in your favor. Now, that was possible when he started. Of course, eventually, casinos went to, you know, multiple decks and constant shuffling, and it's no longer possible. But but at the time he did it, it was possible. Yeah. So Jack, when, when you're going through and deciding who's going to be included, I mean, it, it's like the Academy Awards of trading, right? How do you come to the conclusion of, you know, this person's, this person makes the cut, this person doesn't. Yeah. So I'm always looking for one or two things, basically. Um, I'm even looking for somebody who has taken a, modest amount of money and turned it into a fortune, you know? So, and that's always, regardless of what happens, you know, like somebody like Richard Dennis who starts for a few hundred dollars in the mid amp pit. And at some point is worth 200 million. Now he went on later on and he lost money and stuff like that, but I don't give a damn. No, yeah. anybody turns 200, 200 million, you know, screw it. I mean, that's, that's a story, right? Um, I, I have in this new book, uh, a fellow by the name of Jeff Newman, you know, I, I get an email uh, a couple of years ago, and to, you know, he's, he kind of writes me that this is what he's done, and he's basically telling me that he's he turned a few thousand dollars into fifty million or whatever. And you know, you know, there's always a bit of skepticism there, right? But I, I well, I read it back first. I'm not doing a book now, 
But hey, if you can prove that, that's a great story and I'd be interested. Turns out for reasons I didn't anticipate, within a year, I decided to do on non-marker wizards. I get back to him and he's, I have him send, he sends me all the statements going back to 2006. And a guy literally turned less than 5,000 into 50 million. And the kicker is, since I did the book, since the book came out last November, I interviewed him, I guess, I don't know about, uh, close to two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago. And, uh, and in that interim, he's kind of quintupled that the last time I spoke to him. Wow. So he's continued to do it. So somebody like that is just, it's an extraordinary story. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. You turn a few thousand into hundreds of millions. I mean, you can't beat that, right? So that's always, that's a given. I mean, that's, there's no, you don't have to be a genius to figure out that's, that's a good choice. Um, the other one is people who have just great return to risk. So I've interviewed people who's, not that they made tremendous returns, but they had really, really solid, consistent return to risk. And so I'll use that for a long time, like 10 or 20 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's the other criteria. I'm looking for one of those two. Uh, you know, somebody who has high returns, but is all over the place and, you know, maybe they make a few million. That's not a story. You know? So how do you find these people? Right. Because oh, yeah. I so, mean, today there's so many gurus on, yeah, yeah. on so, the Internet. It'd be so, so yeah, so you have to, I have to verify stuff because you know, I can't believe you can't believe anybody. Right. Um, so we'll take the last book. I found people in three ways. One is I knew a couple of these people. Uh, yeah, it, it, Peter Brandt, who's, who's the first chapter, he's actually a friend and I've intended to put him in a book and um, I think he has a tremendous amount of wisdom to impart about the markets. So I knew next time I did a book, I would put him in. Um, this fellow, Jeff Newman, he had contacted me. I knew him because he contacted me. Another really interesting interview in the new book, Chris Camillo, who, who used a technique that I didn't even, couldn't even imagine existed. It wasn't fundamental. It wasn't technical. Um, and, but he approached me. He wanted to speak to me. He wanted to meet. And so sort of, I said, okay, you know, and he flew out to, Bol to Boulder and we had, you know, we had lunch together. And it was, it was on a different, he was, he was thinking of doing a project and he wanted to speak to me and that's fine. But he was telling me about Australia. I said, you know, that's pretty interesting. So um, when I did the book, you know, and then he too, I mean, I got all, all the statements. And this is a guy, Chris, in this Chris's case, he, he took like an $80,000 account into 20 million. You know, so again, you know, good story. Um, and so that's so one, and I know some of these people. Second is um, started this, uh, this, I was now with this startup, uh, fundseater.com, which mm -hmm. basically is a website. Traders can, can link their accounts. They can get all sorts of analytics for free. Uh, our goal there is to find traders who are unknown and, uh, you know, have, you know, who are unknown and are particularly skilled, you know, sort of people you wouldn't uncover. Just the, 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 <laughs> the stereotypical guy trading his home office and doing really well and nobody knows he exists. And um, so a few a number of the traders came from, you know, from people we found on that site. So that was another source. And then the third source was I, when I decided to do a book, I have a modest Twitter following, I don't know, about 50,000, whatever. So I, 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 I tweeted that, hey, I'm doing a new book. If, if you believe you're a market wizard or know somebody who is, I'm looking for exceptional performance over lengthy periods of time you know, send me suggestions. And I got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of suggestions. And how did those, you know, a few of those ended up, you know, ending up in the book. So that's how I, that's how I sourced it. Were there ever any times when, cause I, I've had two people on the podcast and geez, I, I'm pushing 600 episodes now. I've had two people on the podcast where when I got done with them, I'm like, this guy's full of it. There, yeah. there's no way that this is legit. And twice I've, I've been in that situation. I'll, I'll never tell anybody who it is, but um, maybe they could probably read my facial expression during it. Cause like it, it was clear whenever, you know, cause it, it's like that, that thing where it's like, 
if uh, if you're telling the truth, you don't have to remember anything, right? And it was the opposite for them. It was right. like just everything didn't make sense. There was no follow through. And by the time I got done, I was almost to the point where I'm like, I don't think I should post this, but I will yeah. anyway. So did that ever happen to you? Yeah. Uh, if I ever feel that, uh, then uh, then I wouldn't obviously, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't right. use it. Uh, there, there, was, uh, there was an instance, in fact, stock market wizards, there was an instance where uh, a trader who had a great track record, audited, you know, ran a fund, uh, audited the track record for a long time, uh, made sense and everything, but turned out, uh, you know, it's one of these things, you know, if the auditors aren't legitimate, you know, if the auditors aren't doing their job, mm. you're screwed, you know. So you get, I, am, I get audit to result, you know, I make sure, I never put anybody in the book, just not gonna tell me something, you know. Um, so in that case, I was using audit results, but then I started hearing rumors that you know something wrong. So I, I pulled down, you know, I pulled a chapter um, and then, uh, you know, about six months later, stuff broke and he turned out to be a fraud, you know? Oh, yeah. So uh, the numbers, he was front running the, he was running the, he was pushing the stocks at the end of the day and, you know, he was doing stuff that was not legitimate. Uh, so I've made mistakes, but um, it's, it's because I relied on something like audited results, you know? I'm not an, and even if I was an accountant, you know, I wouldn't find, you know, say I would necessarily find it. So it can happen. Of course, if if that happens, I I certainly don't want the guy in the book, you know. Uh, right. And he tried to talk me. He tried to talk me into leaving. And of course, you know, I was like, uh, no way. Um, and so I, I basically, you know, I just you know I I ask for you know track records like for everybody. Basically, I need I need to have that. And, and, and you have cases where like, there was one guy who had, you know, sort of phenomenal results. He probably was legitimate, but he didn't want to, he didn't want to be known. And I could even have dealt anonymous if he would have given me his, his thing. I don't, I don't have a big problem keeping somebody anonymous. I haven't done it necessarily, but I wouldn't have a problem if I had the actual track records and I can confirm it was real. But because of that, you know, I said, I couldn't deal with that. So as, as interesting as the story was and as good as he might have done, I, I, I couldn't, you know, I just dropped that. I just don't need it. Yeah. Um, and the closest, the, the closest I can think of, there's, in the original Market Wizards was an interview where it really was hard to believe. Now, I had a, and I put it in a book because I didn't have, in that case, the guy was part of a, a trading group and he, they wouldn't release track records or whatever. But I had a, uh, I was a research director at one of my employees who I trusted and knew well, had sat with this guy like for six months at a side. And he was telling me this guy is the real thing. So I, I put that in the book. I, I said, look, here's the thing. I, I you know, don't have, but I have, I, I, you know, I was using what, what the verification, the reader can decide, you know, and, it, so, so that was an example where I didn't have the track record, uh, but you know I had sort of eyewitness somebody who would like sat with the guy for six months who I personally knew who was vouching for it. So that's what, and I put that in the book. So is that good enough? Maybe not. Maybe yes, but the reader can decide. So that's one instance I can I can think of. Uh, but other than that, I really, particularly now, you know, all these recent books, I. I basically need to get, you know, I need to have the track records. Yeah. And because a lot of these stories are just, you just can't really believe them, you know? Uh, and, and they're really, there's re, re, a lot of mind boggling. One, one trade in this book literally had an 800% day. A day. 800% day. Now, you know, if I tell you that, you're going to say, come on. No How way. do you mathematically do that? Yeah. Well, so, um, I mean, it was like turning, he, he, he had like $100,000, he turned it into two million or something on one, day, uh, on one trade. Um, but it was, it's in the book, but it's, it wasn't the flyer. He, this was a type of trade that he looks for. He went all in, he called it exactly right. And, you know, 
uh, but I mean, that's an extreme. I mean, that's, there's nothing, you know, 800 percent. I mean, that's like, I picked that just because it's so totally unbelievable. Yeah. You know, so. For sure. Speaking of unbelievable, do you ever have a chance to have a uh, Brady Madoff come across your desk? Uh, Seems actually, like he would be your guy. Yeah. Right. So, so I used to work for a uh, hedge fund advisory firm, uh, which had got acquired with a London based firm. I was the one U S partner. Um, I worked in the U S I just would travel there, uh, you know, every quarter or whatever. And um, so there, were, it wasn't made of himself, but he had, he had this like Greenwich outfit that marketed his fund. I forget who they were. And um, I remember going out to, to meet with them. And it was like, just, he was so obtuse, you know, nothing was, you know, so, I mean, so we never considered him, you know, investing, but we did, I did go to speak to them. You know? Wow. How about that? So just, you, yeah. you actually had a, a chance to meet with them. Did, did it yeah. ever come across? Cause I feel like there was a, there, there I, I know. So, so Jack, one of my goals this year is to read a hundred books and one of the books I know for sure I read this year, said, somebody said that they had a chance to meet with Bernie and they went through his records and they're like, they're, either this guy's lying or he's committing fraud. I, I wish I could tell you where I, I heard that, but I remember somebody well, had gone through it. The one who's famous for is Marco Polos, of course. And, and, and this, is the, this is just, I mean, people probably know this, or a lot of people know it, but Marco Polos, I think he wrote his original article, literally called... You know, like 19 reasons why Madoff is a fraud, written I think somewhere or somewhere around 2002. I mean, way before it came out, uh-huh. and they were compelling reasons. Um, and the SEC, you know, where were they? You know, mm-hmm. God, I mean, he laid out the whole case, and he was right to the letter, every bit of it. And I mean, he he became famous for that eventually. Um, interestingly, we talked about Thorpe. In, in the interview, Thorpe had one story where he had clients, and one of his clients said, hey, you know, I'm invested in this guy made up. Could you take a look? At and Thorpe, you know. That must have been it, right? It must have been that. He got yeah. boxes of stuff, and he went over it, and he found stuff like there were these big option trades where there's no volume in that option and all sorts of – and he told the guy, get your money out. He's a fraud. So people who looked – you know, it was there. It was there. Yeah. That, that, that was the story I was thinking of. Like I say, I, I, I am at 87 books so far this year and it's September. So they kind of are starting to all run together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's quite a, that's quite a goal. 100%. So, so um, you spoke to Richard Dennis shortly after the turtle experiment was, was on its yeah. early, early structure. Right. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that whole turtle idea. I, the way that I trade is very turtle esque. What were you thinking at the time, um, talking to him, getting the idea of it? Because this is still in the early, early days of like system trading, right? That still before, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but reading through the original Market Wizards, I almost felt like there was a tone of like, the only way to trade is discretionary. And then here comes Richard Dennis, and he's like, well, let me show you guys how it's done. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so the truth of the matter is, if you go through all my wizard books, you will find that the vast majority are discretionary. The vast majority. And there's no accident because it's very difficult to get extraordinary performance being systematic. Other than people like Thorpe or D.E. Shaw, which is system, which is quantitative, I would make a distinction. It's totally quantitative, but it's not systematic in the way people think is systematic. It's not a buy-sell signal. It's more a matter of you know strategy, which is take trying to extract mathematical inefficiencies out of the market, which is really a different thing. But purely systematic trading, very difficult to turn that into. I got one systematic trader in this new book, uh, and he's got he's done fine. He's you know twenty percent a year for twenty years. I mean, nothing to apologize to, nothing wrong with that. But it's not it's not like some of the other traders, you know, who you know turning you know making a hundred million, so right. uh, or or whatever, or or having you know. Uh, Sortina ratios of 10 to 10 to 1 or whatever. So uh, the reason why it, it is to get exceptional return risk or you know, these incredible returns 
it, it really is almost to, only doable discretionarily other than for the math quants like the Renaissance shows, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and something like trend following, well, particularly now it's changed, but even back in Dennis's day, in the early days where, it, you know, back in the seventies and eighties, where it was working really well. I mean, it, it worked well, it made money, but it, it wasn't an, ex- well, in Dennis's case, he, he really multiplied it, but um, it, Certainly over time. You're good. I can still see you and hear you. You're good. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, so I don't know. I got this pop up here. But anyway, uh, certainly over time, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, not, it, it's not been possible to get phenomenal return to risk out of it as it's become more popular and so forth. In those early days, you know, there were high returns with volatility. Uh, you know, good return to risk, not unbelievable return to risk. Uh, and, but that was true in the heyday. And as it's become more popular, it may still be a, a, a potential way of trading the markets that's profitable, but it's not a way of getting you know, su- superlative results over time. You may have good years, you have bad years, you may make money over time, but it's going to be with volatility and the return to risk is, you know, can be good, but not extraordinary. Um, I mean, maybe the people out there using trend of volume approaches who have extraordinary return risk, but I've not found it. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, Jack, what's next for you on the horizon? You talked about funseeder.com. What else is going on with you? Uh, you you know, I'm kind of taking it easy right now. So, (laughs) you know, I finished the last book. I'm, you know, I, I, I typically don't write books one after the other. Um, I usually take, you know, these five, six years between books. Um, and uh, so I've got really, you know, you know, yeah, I'm in, I'm in my early seventies, right? So it's not like I'm, you know, looking for lots of work. So I'm, I'm happy mm-hmm. to, to do a lot of hiking and cross country skiing and reading and, and just doing, you know, and, tra- and trading, you know, but it, trading is a hobby. It doesn't uh, doesn't occupy my day. You know, before I go a hike, go on a hike, I may look at the markets and stuff like that. And then when I come back, but you know, it's stuff like that. So right now, I don't have a project going. Gotcha. Other than other than consulting with Front Cedar. Yeah. Well, Jack, I got to say, I am so grateful that we had a chance to chat with you today, and that we were able to work through these technical issues for a minute. I'm yeah. like, oh no, <laughs> I was looking so forward to this, and now it's gone. But yeah, I'm so glad we were able to do this. So Jack, um, you know, let's let's make sure we send everybody to funseeder.com, see see how well that works for them. And then I'm also going to have linked down below uh, all of your books, which I am a huge advocate of. And in fact, I think I'm going to go grab Market Sense and Nonsense. Um, I haven't read that one yet, but I can put that in my queue for the rest of the year. Yeah, you, know, you should find some interesting stuff in there. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm looking forward to that. Jack, this has been an absolute pleasure. And I really, really do appreciate the the ability to connect with you and to learn more about you. It was nice talking with you. You as well. Have a great weekend, sir. Okay, take care. Okay, so what'd you think? That was pretty incredible, right? Now, if you like that, that's only a taste, only a sample of what you're going to find in the full AI stock trading system. And I really highly encourage you to go and check this out. Obviously, you are interested in learning and how to trade, and that's why you're listening to this podcast. Now, I'm going to take and download my entire trading system that I use day in and day out onto you. (laughs) <laughs> and the only way I'm going to be able to do that is over at the AI stock trading system.com. You're going to get phase one, two, and three, several bonuses. And on top of that, I'm going to walk you through over a dozen trades that I put on inside of my account, holding your hand and showing you exactly how I got in, how I got out, how I use the artificial intelligence data and how this could work inside of your own trading portfolio on a daily basis. So make sure you head on over to AIStockTradingSystem.com. That's AIStockTradingSystem.com to learn more and to get started and to download my decade plus worth of trading experience into your hands so you can start using the AI Stock Trading System today, the five-step system to take the guesswork out of trading.
Hey, if you like this video, let me know by leaving me a like below and then subscribe and share it with somebody you think could use it as well. Be sure to comment below with your biggest takeaway from this episode and any suggestions you have for future episodes. And finally, make sure you watch these other videos to help you trade faster and trade smarter, and I'll see you on the next episode.